You know who's got it all figured out? Sponges. They have no brain, so they were able to get through 2020 without having any opinions. They have no nervous system, therefore no anxiety, and they have no sex organs. So when they fall in love, you know it's real. They have no organs, no tissues, and they have no sense of sight, taste, smell, and touch. And generally, they don't move around too much. You might expect an animal lacking all of these important features to not be a very successful survivor. But this is exactly how sponges have been existing for over 600 million years. More than existing, actually. They've been thriving. While having a complex body plan has its obvious benefits, sponges are living proof that simplicity can work just as well. There are some challenges, of course. Like, how does an animal with no mouth obtain food? And how does an animal with no sex organs reproduce? We'll answer all these questions and more in today's episode of Miller's Wildlife. The goal of this series is to explore every living branch on the animal tree of life. And where better to start this journey than at the very beginning, with the most ancient animals in evolutionary history that are still around today, the sponges. Sponges make up the entirety of the phylum Porifera. There are approximately 5,000 species within this phylum, and they can be found in almost every marine habitat, from shallow tide pools down to depths of nearly 9,000 meters below sea level. They exist in every coral reef, and a few even live in freshwater lakes and streams. The only place that a sponge couldn't live is in a pineapple. Get out of here with your fake news. Sponges haven't changed too much throughout evolutionary history. You might expect this to mean that they're somehow primitive or less advanced than other species, and from a certain perspective, that's true. But another way to look at it is that sponges have developed a body plan that just hasn't required too many upgrades. For a sponge, simplicity is key. Most animals have cells that join together to form tissues, and tissues that join together in multiple layers to form organs. To a sponge, that's all a big dumb waste of time. Instead, they have a squad of specialized cells that all perform different functions that keep the sponge alive and healthy. The outer surface of a sponge is a single layer of cells called panacocytes. Think of it like sponge skin. The inner surface of the sponge is lined with cells called choanocytes. Choanocytes are incredibly hard workers, generating a current by rapidly waving a hair-like flagella and trapping food particles in a sticky collar around the base bringing bacteria, plankton, and other microscopic bits of organic matter into the cell for digestion. Waste and anything not used by the sponge is then pushed back into the water through an opening called the oscula. Some sponges have one large oscula, like this vase sponge, and some have multiple smaller oscula, like this yellow ball sponge. In between the porous outer layer and the choanocyte covered inner layer is a gel-like material called mesoglia. A lot of weird stuff goes down in the mesoglia. Moving around within the mesoglia are cells called amoebocytes. I know this is a lot of new sponge words all shoved in your face at once, but do your best to absorb whatever you can. Back to amoebocytes. These cells, named after amoeba, which they strongly resemble, have a few different jobs. Their main one is to create structures within the sponge that give it its shape and allow it to grow larger. These structures are spongin and spicules. Spongin is the material that makes some sponges feel spongy, like the ones whose carcasses we rub on our bodies in the shower. Spongin is soft and flexible, but sturdy enough to hold its shape. Spicules, in contrast, are hard and rigid, which makes some sponges feel stiff and prickly. Spicules come in a huge variety of shapes and structures, and because they're made of minerals like calcium and silica, they fossilize much more easily than the rest of the sponge. Fossil spicules have been discovered that date back over 580 million years. Since almost every cell in a sponge's body has constant exposure to seawater, carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange can happen at the cellular level, meaning that each and every cell breathes on its own. Sponges are literally eating, pooping, and breathing all at the same time 24-7. It's quite a lifestyle. This method of obtaining nutrients is so effective that a single sponge the size of a baseball can filter several gallons of seawater in a single day. In this way, sponges help recycle nutrients for other marine life in the way that fungi and plants do for creatures on land. So next time you're swimming in the ocean and the water looks extra clear, thank a sponge. Thank you. All right, final question. How does a sponge reproduce? As you can see, there's a very distinct lack 
of external genitalia. Members of the phylum periphera aren't super picky about anything. And that includes making more of themselves. They can either reproduce asexually by producing small buds that break off from the parent sponge and drift until they find a good place to settle down and grow into adults, or they can reproduce sexually, which is far more interesting and exactly as romantic as you would expect from a sponge. Sponges are able to produce both egg cells and sperm cells but never at the same time, because self-fertilization limits genetic diversity, and that's generally frowned upon in the animal world. A sponge will send a massive amount of sperm cells into the water from their osculum. What happens next depends on the species. Some sponges will send their eggs out into the water to be fertilized externally, and others will absorb the sperm into their bodies to be caught by the choanocytes. The choanocytes then transport the sperm into the mesoglia and deliver it to an egg cell, where it develops into a cute little larva. After a short developmental period, the larva is birthed out into the ocean where it actually swims around until it finds a comfortable surface to spend the rest of its life. Sponges are living paradoxes. They don't do anything, but at the same time, they do a lot of things. They're simple in their complexity, but at the same time, complex in their simplicity. They were the first animals, and more than likely, they'll be sticking around for a long, long time. Next week, we're gonna meet the tenophores, another group of ancient, simple marine animal who are way more than meets the eye. Until then, stay curious, stay connected, and never stop evolving.